From the beginning of Mark, the reader knows who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God, Mark 1.1. However, people in the story struggle with understanding just who he is and what he is all about, except for those with demons. They know exactly who he is. The demons recognize him and wither before his mighty words. But Jesus rather consistently commands that they keep this information quiet. Why this command for secrecy? Bible students for centuries have mulled over this question. Welcome to Whispering Hope this Friday morning. All quarter we have been studying the book of Mark. Today we are almost to the end. We're at week 12. Tried and crucified. A very important aspect in Jesus' ministry. And in the house we have Dr. Wayne Knowles, Dr. K. White. I'm going to invite both of them to greet us all here this good Friday morning. And then we're going to ask Dr. Knowles to pray for us to jump into our study for this week all right good morning to everyone it's a pleasure once again to be on whispering hope sabbath school and today we know that the lord is ready to speak to us and we're very excited about the discussion so welcome to everyone well good morning and it's a wonderful day to be alive it's a preparation day i hope and trust that our time together would be a blessing and that we will all continue to study the word of god bow your head with me as we pray father god as we are about to share in your word again we ask for your guidance and blessing upon us be with us lead us into truth and may your word be transformational in our lives in jesus name we pray amen amen our topic for the week tried and crucified tried and crucified you know what imagery comes to your mind as you think of the trial and you think of the crucifixion help us paint a picture this morning we started last week where we ended with taken and now continuing tried and crucified speaking about jesus and his trials not just by the sanhedrin by the religious body but also by the civil body we and by the crowd and the soldiers the whole community in a sense was trying him they mocked him they taunted him and then eventually they crucified him on the cross so it's a very important lesson that we are today as we look at how the crowd and the secular body last week we look at the religious body treated him and the fact that he died and suffered so that we can be saved yes i think this is a very important topic as we consider the lesson for this week i like the way the writer was really able to speak about you know the irony of the way everything will play out at the end as we consider the mission jesus christ came to accomplish he said he came to die and so it was known that he would he would die interestingly his death you know and well the trial is really interesting and i like as i said the, the way the writer was able to show that he's the king of the universe he is really the judge but then he's going to be judged he's going to be tried and then he's going to be crucified on a cross i mean a gruesome death he's gonna die a death that criminals should die so it's really interesting i think the title really captures what the writer was able to to share this week and uh, the fact that as jesus is coming to the end of his ministry he will be tried he will be crucified but it's all a part of the salvation plan amen now let's take a look at our memory text mark 15 34 and it says and at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Please enlighten us on this text. Well, these were the final words of Jesus as he gave his life on the cross. And when we look at these words, speaking to the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can go back to next week, to last week, sorry, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he kept praying, but the Father, nothing was said that the Father responded, the silence, now we see the abandonment. And it really speaks to the fact of the mission of Christ. When Christ came, he came to die as a human being. He didn't needed help in the garden of gethsemane he struggled through 
And I'm happy that he was willing to go forward on our behalf. And that's what Isaiah 53 speaks about. He was wounded for a transgression. And that is such a great feeling to know that somebody loved me enough to die in my place. And the father in heaven didn't help him because what he would look is that he couldn't be the right substitute if he had help for the father. So it's very clear from what he cried out. It's a testimony that Jesus bore the cross as a human sacrifice for our sins. And he didn't require divine intervention to make it through. He did it on his own and he suffered the agony, the pains like any other human being. And he endured it so that you and I can be saved. Amen. 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 As we consider the life of Christ, and it's amazing how, you know, the Old Testament was able to predict so much about his life, uh, right down to the final moments of his life, his death on the cross. And even this very passage also repeated in Psalm 22 and verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so definitely Jesus Christ making those statements, those final words were already prophesied in the Old Testament that he would, he would say this, a number of events surrounding the cross. Also, we see the prophecy in the, in the Old Testament. And it, it really just shows us that we can, we can trust God's word. We, we recognize that at this moment, as Dr. Noel shared, it, it, Jesus came to the point now he's going to die. He's overwhelmed because he's human, but at the same time, he's excited <laughs> that he will ultimately die for us. So it's just amazing how it's prophesied. It will come to pass. It did come to pass, but also shows his humanity at that moment, but he's equally excited to give his life. And we continue to emphasize that last week, that he was not forced to do anything. He willingly gave his life and we don't look at like a, we don't look at a moment like this where jesus is saying why have you forsaken me to think that at any point he's regretting what he has to do he's not regretting anything yes the humanity like last week is revealed but but we can also consider the fact that jesus christ was ready to do this because salvation was more important to him uh, than even the father forsaking him at that moment. What may appear to be the father forsaken him beyond that, salvation was most critical to Christ. Amen. I want to thank both of you for sharing this, Father. The question I'm about to ask, it has to do with the theology of substitution. And I'm not sure that everybody listening to us knows what it is. The doctor knows. I'm going to ask you just to give us a definition or help us to understand what it truly is so that they can understand the question I will ask subsequently. Well, substitution means someone took my place. The theology of substitution means that God made the arrangement for someone to take our place. Instead of us dying, we have someone who died in our place and his death brings us eternal life gives us an opportunity for eternal life and that one is jesus christ so it's about someone taking our john 3 16 says that for god so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life so jesus became that substitute for us so that we do not perish but have eternal life amen thank you so very much so the question says look at how central the theology of substitution was to ellen g white and also the bible and for instance we're going to reference isaiah 53 and i'm going to ask you guys just to pull out some aspects of isaiah 53 that speaks to jesus acting as our substitute well, right away, we go to Isaiah 53, 5. Right? I think this is the one that's so pronounced. The Bible says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The, ch the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. So we say, praise the Lord this morning. So definitely, He took our place. We deserved at the death which He he died. He took on our condemnation. Hence, Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because of sin. We were all condemned to die and he has taken our place for us. But I love the passage most of all in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, when the apostle Paul says, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty, 
might become rich. So we see Jesus having a way of taking our place. He, take, he takes the burdens. The weight of sin is upon him. He is innocent, but he decides, I will step in and really take it. So I think Isaiah 53, 5 really covers it, that it was our transgressions, but he decided that he will be wounded for it. It was our iniquities, but he decided that he is going to be that. And it's just a moment of celebration that the holy God of heaven came to be the substitute. And that is a moment of rejoicing. Amen. Indeed. I just, just want to add two verses to what Pastor White shared. Verse 4 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And that's what substitution is. The pain that I deserve because of my sin. He took my sin. So he took my pain. He took my suffering. He bore it because he took my sin. And then the verse ended. Yet we considered him punished by God. So the punishment I deserve, he received. Stricken by him and afflicted. The, the striking that we deserve, he received. That's what substitution is. And the affliction that should have fallen upon us, Jesus received it. And when we go down to verse 11, it says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. So there's a purpose for it. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. By being our substitute, many will be saved. And then the last part says, and he will bear their iniquities. So he took our sins and he took the punishment we deserve so that the son of God became the son of man to substitute in our place to die for all the sons of men so that we can become children of God. That's the beauty of the story of Jesus being our substitute. Amen. That is so reassuring. My next question, why is any theology that Dom plays the central role of substitution and Christ dying in our stead, paying in himself the penalty for our sins, a false theology? It's definitely a false theology because it undermines, you know, the ministry of Christ and what he came to do. Remember, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there'll be no remission for sin. It simply means that we could not have really paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus had to do that for us. He had to be that substitute because he was flawless and he is flawless. He is perfect. And when we consider this whole um, aspect or this whole idea of substitution, Jesus is really doing it because he loves us. Love has a way of giving you know, and, and Jesus gave his all. He gave himself. And as the songwriter says, what more can he do? He gave himself. So any theology that will disregard this, in my estimation, disregards the unconditional love of a God who says, I will die in your place. And so this cannot be disregarded. This must be embraced that Jesus gave himself for us and died the death that I should have died, that you should have died. I just want to add that it's the only way that we could have been saved. There's no other option available. And Hebrews 10, 26 says, there remain no other form of salvation for mankind. If we reject this, that's it. So anyone who preaches a different gospel or fail to emphasize this gospel of Christ dying in our place is really missing the true purpose for why Christ came. And this must be emphasized from our pulpit because Christ is the only hope for mankind. There's nothing else that gives us hope. The Bible says, Paul tells us we're saved by hope. We hope in Christ. And so it is through Christ that our sins are covered. It is through Christ that we have the power over death and demons and devils. It is through Christ that we are afforded salvation. He is the only option that we have for salvation. And so we had to sing it from the house top. There's nothing else, no, no situation, no event in scripture that saves us. We are saved to a person, Jesus Christ. Paul calls it the foolishness of the gospel alone that saves a person. And so this should be the essence of what we preach, we speak, we witness to. And as we accept Christ, we have to live lives of obedience to him. You know, some churches only preach accept Christ. we got to live a life of obedience to what Christ asks us to do. And the good news is, it is this Christ that is our 
judge and our savior. And it is this Christ that is coming back. We're not coming back. Jesus is not coming back to, to get buildings and all these things. He's coming back for people. So he came, he died, and he is coming back to take us to be with him. Amen. You know, we're going to look at Barabbas. And we know the story of Pilate. And Ellen G. White puts this this way. Pilate longed to deliver Jesus. So he knew he had innocence, an innocent man in front of him. But he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his power, his position, and his honor. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. And, you know, that really struck at me and pretty hard. So we know the story of Barabbas. Who or what is the Barabbas? And we're applying it today. In today's world, that get asked for instead of Jesus. Well, it's an interesting question. Who was Barabbas? Let's start there. Barabbas was someone that the people chose a criminal instead of Christ. They just didn't want Christ. There was a certain mindset. The religious people rallied the crowd together. They didn't want Jesus. They saw Jesus as a blasphemer, an imposter, and so they didn't want Christ. So Barabbas is that person who was chosen ahead of Christ, not because of merit, but because people didn't want Christ. If we are to apply that today, it would be anyone or anything that we put ahead of Christ. That would be our Barabbas today. Not because of merit, but because we reach a stage in our life where we don't love Christ anymore. We don't want him in our lives. And there are many persons today who reach that stage where anything you tell them about Christ, they don't want. You tell them about Christ, they prefer cannibal. You tell them about Christ, they prefer something else. You, you know, so... That is what Barabbas fits. It fits the narrative that we reject Christ, so we fill that in, that space in, with anything else other than Christ. And that's a crying shame for many people today. And woe beyond the church if we make anything that we teach or preach more significant than Christ himself. Yeah, and that's what Dr. Knowles has shared here, because as we consider Barabbas, he is a criminal, and Christ is clearly, or Christ clearly was an innocent, innocent man, and individuals say, give us, give us the criminal, give us the criminal. And as we look at the world today, definitely think Dr. Knowles shared it so beautifully, you know, individuals go after the politicians, individuals go after the wealth of, of this world, individuals go after the fame. There's no direct rush from individuals to do that which is humble and that which is pure and right in the sight of God. The evil, people are drawn to the evil, people are drawn to the evil. It's just a sad age and it was sad then that Christ was rejected for this criminal and it is sad today as you see the kind of evil in our world and people say give me the guns give me the marijuana give me the evil it is such a sad reality but in the end you know we come to realize that jesus christ is still in control truly amazing now i thank both of you for your contribution you know we go to the story of joseph of Arimathea, and it paints a very interesting picture you know at jesus death disciples all disappeared and here Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, shows up and asks for Jesus' body. So watch the story of Joseph of Arimathea tells us about not judging outward appearances. And sometimes the, the individuals we expect to be there for us may not be the persons who will be there for us. And as the writer continues to play with this word um, irony throughout the, the lesson this week, it's interesting, it's ironic that at the end, uh, that it is not the disciples who are going to be there to try to get you know, Jesus buried in an appropriate way. It is really going to be an individual who is a member of the Sanhedrin, an individual who is clearly not the one who's expected to do that. And it really says to us, we cannot judge anyone. This gentleman, he was rich. We anticipate that individuals who are wealthy, maybe they're not going to embrace the message of Christ. We have to preach the gospel and share the gospel with everyone because Christ is able to save anybody. The prostitute on the street can be reached with the gospel so we cannot look at the outward appearance. We have to allow God 
to have his way. And it's just an amazing story how this turned out. Uh, and in the end, the name of God was glorified in the situation. I would say, in addition to what Pastor White just shared, that sometimes the people we condemn based on religion even, because he never at this point professed to be a follower of Christ before this point. Sometimes based on person's profession or religious background, we sometimes put them in the, the dustbin. But God works on the heart of people outside of my knowing and your knowing. And uh, every so often, God surprises us. And we have to be mindful of that, that God alone knows the heart. And a person who may be silent at the trial of Jesus, he probably didn't speak up when they were crying out, give us Barabbas. But knowing who Jesus was and the message he had, his heart was softened by the whole encounter. And sometimes our timing is not God's timing. And that is why we have to be patient with people, pray for people, because what we see may not be all to the story. Pray that God works in the heart of every person, regardless of who they are, positions they hold, possessions they have, or religious persuasion. Because God doesn't just look at the outward appearance, he looks at the heart. Amen. You know, we're wrapping this lesson up for this week. And, you know, we're asked to review Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And it talks about Jesus' appearance pretty much. I'll just read some aspects of it for those who are following us. And it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy one. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in trouble sometimes. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. I want to pause there. And the question says, why should you be able to give a Bible study on this section to anyone who asks? And the question is, can you? I know the pastors can, but I'm just I am just asking uh, what is in front of me. Yeah, well, the why part of it is because it's such a critical passage in Old Testament revelation of who Jesus is and who he would have been from that pr prophecy going forward. When we look at passages like Isaiah, when we look at passages like Genesis 3.15, these speak specifically to the hope of mankind. And when we look at what happened in the life of the children of Israel, this particular passage was an amazing revelation that Daniel received that shared so many important things about Christ. And uh, when we look at the specifics, there are many persons who argue over Daniel 8, 14, what it means, but you cannot argue over Daniel 9, 27, because it really speaks to who will come, the Messiah, the specifics, and then it gives you some dates from Daniel 9, 24. So when you count backwards, you end up with how the prophecy begins, and it kind of gives us a sense of what Daniel 8, 14 very well might relate to when we apply the time frame because there's a major controversy daniel 8 14 more so but for us as seven events is daniel 9 24 to 27 focuses on christ and it fulfills so precisely that it helps us to understand the rest of the book of daniel in a more specific way but anything that highlights christ is more important than any other message in the bible and I'll just make one more point on this. Daniel was looking for the restoration of a nation and was seeking clarification and revelation on the restoration of Jerusalem. But the revelation he got was the restoration of the world through Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah was more important than all the benefits that Israel could have with the temple, with the walls restored, with any great king. And this is the greatest revelation and promise that Daniel could have received. He didn't understand it, but yet still God revealed this to him, which helped to show that what the Bible said in the old comes to pass in the new and that Jesus is more important 
than any achievement Israel could ever have had. And this was salient because Daniel was looking for a restored kingdom. But a king, Jesus, is more important than a restored kingdom. He is the king. And hence, we are to celebrate this passage and continue to teach it. Amen. And also, I think Dr. Knows gave us our Bible study on the passage. So I can, we can leave it there. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys for your takeaways from this week's lessons, something that you want us all to hold on to. Yeah, what stood out in my mind this week was the whole idea of this irony and what it really means as we reflect on who Jesus Christ is. Uh, because everything is taking place and, you know, it's ironic that, you know, he's king, but he's going to be judged by, you know, an earthly king or he's judged and he's going to be judged by an earthly judge. Uh, but it all speaks to how humble Jesus Christ was. Th just the fact he is such a servant, he's such a humble individual. And I think in all the the, the statements uh, throughout the week and all the analogies utilized by the, 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 the writer, he just points to the fact our God is so humble. And clearly he's humble. He left the splendor of heaven as the king of the universe and came down to die a cruel death and to live a life that we should live. And I just, I'm really excited about this and i look at my life we look at our lives and we say lord help us to be humble help us to be like christ help us to understand that there's nothing to gain in this world that ultimately if we want to gain that kingdom which is prepared for us because the god we we serve and love he has given his all so that we can have life and have it more abundantly so that was my takeaway this week my takeaway is just the reflection on the entire experience from his trial to his crucifixion and the impact that Jesus made on the life of all those around him. From Pilate in the judgment hall, who was trying his best to preserve the life of an innocent man, to the crowd that cried crucify him. Jesus makes an impact for good or for your ill on every single life. And what the centurion said at the end, this must be the son of God. What Joseph of Arimathea confirmed that it doesn't matter your status from the palace to the pulpit, to the soldier on the street, to the criminal on the cross. Jesus's life is adequate to make an impact and to save anyone. And that's what stood out to me. No one is left out of the impact that Christ can make for the good of their lives. Amen. Truly, we have had a deep study this morning as we looked at Jesus' life surrounding his trial and his crucifixion. And we just want to say, oh, what love, what marvelous love displayed on Mount Calvary. You know, we talk about substitution, and I'm sure that Dr. Noel will not substitute his child's life for mine. No, sir, none of them. But Jesus, in his love, gave us his only son. And that's amazing love. What greater love than the life of Christ? And so we want to thank Dr. Knowles and Dr. White for sharing with us this morning. We ask God's constant blessings over their homes, over their ministries, over their lives, and that they will continue to be a light in the darkness. And to all of Whispering Hope, we want to thank you for being tuned in with us each and every morning. We honor your loyalty, and we just want to say how much we love you. We invite you this evening to, for Ask Your Pastor series at 6.30. And then at 7, we have our young adult, adult lesson, The Inverse, where we listen to our young people unpack God's words. Just want to let you know that pressing on is pressing on. We have had to make some adjustments in the dates, but God's New Generation concert is now slated for the 5th of October instead of the 28th. We ask you to support this worthy cause. We're helping to feed the homeless. Come with your heart, especially to be blessed, but come bringing an offering. So until we see you tomorrow on Whispering Hope, we just want to bid you God's blessings.